many viewers will undoubtedly have heard of a similar and much better documented tale of a mad gasser in the Illinois town of Mattoon, known to have taken place in 1944. Naturally, a logical assumption would be to conclude the Mattoon event was directly influenced by that which occurred in the counties of Botetot and Roanoke, Virginia. Such an assumption is built on rather shaky ground, however. With a single exception, the Botetot gasser was only mentioned in local newspapers, and then in a rather subdued, if not skeptical, manner, headlines stating such terms as attack in suggestive quotation marks. The one article that appeared in the New York Times, January 22, 1934 edition, was relatively brief. Other journalistic write-ups about Botetot only came about a half century after the original incident, long after most involved had passed away. It would seem, then, that the citizens of Mattoon would likely have no knowledge of their counterparts 600 miles to the east and a decade earlier. This is all the more intriguing when one compares specifics regarding each event. In both Botetot and Mattoon, the gas in question was often described as smelling sweet and inducing nausea, partial paralysis, weakness, and swelling of the face. In both events, authorities, be they doctors and or police, confirmed an odd odor in some of the houses, although admittedly in regards to Botetot, these confirmations were quite small in number. In both events, some families were attacked more than once. Some nights saw multiple disparate attacks, and some houses were gassed while the occupants were absent. Perhaps most bizarrely, at one point in both Botetot County and Mattoon, a woman's shoe print was found beneath a window. In the case of Mattoon, this evidence was found at the home of Mrs. Bertha Birch, who also claimed to have witnessed a woman dressed as a man fleeing from the scene. It is tempting to brush off the Botetot gassings and its later historical doppelganger as a folktale of yesteryear, an unreliable fiction for the titillation of country bumpkins. But the gassings, or whatever they were, were in fact openly reported in local media, responded to by civil authorities and medical professionals, and received a great deal of attention from local legislative bodies trying to help catch the culprit. In late January 1934, a $500 reward was issued by the Botetot County Board of Supervisors, a not unsubstantial amount at that time, nearly $10,000 in 2020 money. Around the same time, the Virginia General Assembly passed a bill that specifically addressed the gassings, the text still part of state law. If any person maliciously released or caused or procured to be released in any private home, place of business, or place of public gathering, any tear gas, mustard gas, phosgene gas, or other noxious or nauseating gases or mixtures or chemicals designed to and capable of producing vile or injurious or nauseating odors or gases, and bodily injury results to any person from such gas or odor, the offending person shall be guilty of a Class 3 felony. Over time, the gassings in Botetot County, as well as those in Mattoon, have come to be seen as an example of mass hysteria, an event when a group of individuals succumb to a similar delusion, typically brought on by a prevailing fear or looming anxiety, which is reinforced for some members of the group by the actions taken by others, in a sort of self-referential nightmare. Considering the degrees to which good sense was stretched, it's hard to argue with this position. Still, painting with a broad brush is dangerous, as many contrary details can be overshadowed by the desire to reach an answer. Is there anything to support the objective reality of the attacks? If the recollections of Mrs. Moore and Grace Pogue are to be believed, a group of people were said to be nearby just before gassing. On other occasions, a man and woman were seen in the vicinity, always associated with an idling or slowly moving automobile. These sightings are supported by physical evidence, the woman's shoe prints found beneath a window and porch, and later by the roadside. There is really no way to connect said prints or groups to the alleged crimes, however. There is no way to know when the prints around the Huffman home were created. Other women lived on the premises, and the wife of the landlord lived a short distance away. In no source is it clarified if any shoe prints were found in soil or snow. Presumably, the print beneath the window was in the snow, but obviously the print located beneath the porch was not. The roadside prints are even more tenuous. A car parked beside a road is not unusual, nor are footprints. Perhaps someone stopped to stretch their legs. The starter crank found at the Crawford house could have accidentally fallen from the car of a careless motorist. While it seems a tantalizing bit of hard evidence, cars of the type that required a crank starter were considered old-fashioned even in 1934, out of place in many areas. No one ever claimed to have seen such a vehicle. Many of the houses attacked were not equipped with a telephone, 
This may or may not be significant, as having personal access to a telephone in 1934 was somewhat unusual. Of course, if one was trying to avoid alerting police too quickly, one would only attack those without means of communication. Perhaps as time went on, the assailant became more confident and brazen, and the isolation of victims was no longer of paramount concern. The sudden change in venue from Botetourt to Roanoke may also indicate a copycat. For a brief period, the entire affair was front and center of local newspapers, and could have inspired an attention seeker, though admittedly this is pure speculation. Between 1928 and 1931, several potentially lethal poison gas attacks were committed by an unknown assailant in and around the Coogee area of New South Wales, Australia. As many as seven attacks were committed on men, women, and whole families as they were in their homes. The modus operandi, a hole drilled into a gas main, the leaking coal gas directed into the house using a garden hose. Though there were no resulting fatalities, investigations heavily implied murder as the ultimate intent. Aside from a local transient who was arrested in January of 1931 under suspicion of being involved, and who later turned out to have a solid alibi, the only clue to the gasser's identity was a single boot print found under a window. One potential suspect was a local man named Joseph James Madigan. Despite having a wife and five children, Madigan was a serial peeper and flasher, arrested on more than one occasion and becoming universally reviled in his community. Interestingly, Madigan's last incarceration ended only hours before the first known attack and was known to wear work boots, having been seen during one of his criminal excursions stealthily prowling through a garden holding his boots in his hands to avoid creating prints. The evolution from Peeping Tom to Wanton Murderer is not without precedent, the infamous Ted Bundy and Joseph D'Angelo being two notable examples. The sexual gratification achieved through despicable acts, such as peeping, often lessens over time, necessitating an escalation of aggressive behavior to achieve the same result. Also, the violation of an individual's privacy is a covert form of exercising power and control. As time progresses, the covert becomes overt as victims are subjugated physically via coercion, restraint, or even death, the ultimate expression of dominance. Apart from the use of an unusual weapon, the frequency and outright boldness of attacks also calls into question their nature. If the ultimate aim was to do great bodily harm to the occupants of each house, why expose the occupants when one or more of them were awake and alert? Why not simply gas them while they were asleep, as the Kuji gasser had attempted a few years earlier? One possibility, aside from sheer incompetence, is the motive of the gasser or gassers was not murder, but incitement of terror. Perhaps the perpetrator obtained gratification from the fear generated in people being exposed to deadly gases, which would be somewhat more elevated in the years immediately following what was then the worst conflict in human history. Whatever the motive, real symptoms were experienced by those involved. When summarizing the case to the Botetourt County Board of Supervisors on the afternoon of January 9, 1934, both Dr. Driver and Dr. Breckenridge observed that victims of the attacks all experienced, quote, extreme nausea, swelling of the throat and face, and severe headaches." Unquote. Dr. Driver believed the symptoms were all consistent with exposure to chlorine gas, though he also admitted that he never personally detected any unusual odor at any of the houses he visited. Of course, if victims had adequately vented their homes before he arrived, no odor would be expected. One nagging question that continuously cropped up in investigations into the attacks was that of the type of gas used. Of course, knowing this would provide a great deal of credibility toward theories regarding motive, as an extremely lethal substance might indicate an intention of murder. One does not make simple mischief with the use of sarin gas, for example. Just over four hundredths of one percent of the Earth's atmosphere, carbon dioxide is non-reactive, colorless, and odorless, although in high enough concentrations, it has been described as having a faintly acidic smell, similar to watered-down vinegar. Because of its ubiquitous nature, it is, after all, a byproduct of animal metabolism, many people are unaware of hazards posed by large amounts of CO2, the most egregious example being that of the 1986 disaster at Lake Nyos in northwestern Cameroon. Volcanic activity caused an eruption of over a cubic kilometer of water vapor and carbon dioxide from the lake, which oozed into adjacent valleys, smothering thousands of livestock and over 1,700 people in four nearby villages. 
Commercially, carbon dioxide is sometimes used to humanely subdue farm animals for slaughter, and when inhaled will cause extreme drowsiness and severe headaches, both symptoms experienced by many Bodotot victims. Also known as town gas and the weapon of choice in the Kuji gassings, coal gas is a cocktail of hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, and various volatile hydrocarbons, commonly used for both heating and cooking during the early decades of the 20th century. The exact method by which most victims' houses were internally heated has been lost to history, but considering the large coal mining industry in the area, the use of coal gas is not really all that far-fetched. Unlike the common natural gas of today, which is essentially pure methane, odorless, and a great deal safer to use, coal gas intrinsically has a strong, pungent, sulfurous odor. Natural gas is artificially odorized, typically with a substance known as mercaptan. Such an odor was not described by any victim, although some did describe symptoms consistent with carbon monoxide poisoning, including headache, nausea, and general weakness. The trifecta of trench warfare, chlorine, mustard, and phosgene gases were also considered by contemporary investigators, as evidenced by their specific mention in the associated legislative bill. When in a potentially lethal concentration, chlorine gas has a distinct yellow-green color and a sharp odor which reminds many of sour pineapple. Inhaling chlorine gas will generate a notable burning in the throat, eyes, and nasal passages, and eventually culminate in intense abdominal pain and vomiting. As noted by Dr. Driver, the symptoms of some of the victims seemed to mimic that expected from exposure to chlorine. However, despite the fact that chlorine gas is very easy to produce using household bleach and high school chemistry, Dr. Driver's observation was completely countered by Dr. Johnson, who ruled out the use of chlorine, among other substances, due to the lack of irritation to victims' eyes. Mustard gas, which is not actually a gas and is in fact a vaporous oil, is a vesicant, a substance which causes blistering of the skin and mucous membranes. Victims of mustard gas have described the color as amber and the odor as anything from non-existent to similar to garlic, onions, or mustard, the source of its name. In contrast, phosgene, also known as carbonyl dichloride, is colorless and smells of musty hay, causing asphyxiation through edema or fluid retention in the lungs. Though a majority of people exposed to mustard gas recover after proper medical attention, which could describe most of the more severe bodytot attacks, a not insignificant number of victims are left disfigured. Phosgene, on the other hand, has a proportionally high rate of mortality, about six times that of chlorine. Unlike coal gas, chlorine, and, in the form of dry ice, CO2, mustard and phosgene gases would have been quite difficult to obtain, not to mention store, transport, and disperse. Carbon dioxide, chlorine, mustard, and phosgene gases are all substantially heavier than air, a fact that makes some of the claims about the mysterious substance's behavior seem incongruent. Reports about the initial attack on the Huffmans just before Christmas of 1933 universally indicate that at least one of the three gassings that night sent enough fumes into the house for the residents upstairs to be affected. Mr. Huffman, as well as anybody else on the ground floor, would have died outright if enough of any of these types of gases propagated in such a manner. Ultimately, while all three were possibilities at the time, only chlorine was given serious consideration, and none were found to be plausible, but that's not to say they were not viable suspects. In 1933 and 1934, the horrors of battlefield gassings were undoubtedly known to anyone old enough to have fought in or at least had first-hand knowledge of World War I, then known as the Great War. The anxiety generated was undoubtedly similar to that generated by plagues of the past, like disease, once one becomes cognizant of a poisonous gas, it's often too late to do anything about it. The Battle of Ypres nearly two decades earlier would have cemented that possibility into any adult's mind. In 1945, Donald M. Johnson, then a freshman at the University of Illinois, published an essay in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology in which he concluded the Mattoon, Illinois case to be more or less the result of journalistic malpractice, newspapers irresponsibly inflating a dubious story in a provocative and breathless manner, presumably for increased sales. Johnson's view, which is now the dominant theory surrounding the Mattoon events and by extension those occurring in Botetot, is that the entire affair boiled down to a case of collective obsessional behavior, or what would more commonly be described as mass hysteria, akin to the infamous War of the Worlds broadcast of Orson Welles, or the sighting of Springheeled Jack in 19th century London. 
One of the best documented examples of this phenomena occurred over several days in June of 1962 in the dressmaking department of a large North Carolina textile mill. Known as the June Bug Epidemic, which incidentally has little to do with the insect of the same name, as many as 62 of the mill's 965 workers began to suffer bouts of dizziness, nausea, headache, skin rash, and, at least in one woman's case, vomiting. Initially, the blame fell on an infestation of insects that supposedly arrived via a shipment of cloth from England. No insect was ever found, however, and no worker ever tested positive for any viral or bacteriological infection, despite the best investigative efforts by physicians and specialists from the CDC. It was noted at the time that the ensuing epidemic seemed to start, peak, and disappear almost exclusively in an area spatially separated from the rest of the mill, where everyone was constantly in close proximity of each other. Furthermore, as sociologists A.C. Kirchhoff and K.W. Back observed in their paper The June Bug, a study of hysterical contagion, quote, It struck first shift women in the dressmaking departments more consistently than anyone else. And most importantly of all, the epidemic could not be explained in any normal way, unquote. Women and children seem to be disproportionately represented in cases of mass hysteria, although adult men do fall prey to the behavior. Three of those in the June Bug epidemic were men. This is likely due to a higher tendency towards empathy and a general tendency towards interpersonal accommodation. People will often ascribe meaning to something unexpected and then behave in a manner that matches their own expectations. If a population, be they factory workers, students, or small town residents, experience a sudden and unforeseen event, such as a strange odor, certain individuals may react with a physiological response brought on by a pre-existing belief. It is common knowledge that, given enough fear, one can work oneself into enough of a lather to induce vomiting, hives, rash, headaches, and even fainting spells, all afflictions that can come and go at the drop of a hat. The Bidatot and later Roanoke gas attacks do seem to eventually follow the same pattern as that of known cases of mass hysteria. Yet some symptoms claimed to have been suffered by Bottentot victims do seem to be consistent with certain gases. The population of the county was somewhat homogenous, comprised of mainly farmers and laborers and their families, yet they were not in close proximity to one another and, as a whole, socially isolated from any other group. Women seemed to be notably more affected than men, yet a large percentage of claimants were men, and in the attack on the Kelly residence of December 27th, the only claimant. The earliest attacks, such as that on the Huffmans and Halls, contained little or nothing for participants' psyches to feed upon. There was no indication either the Huffmans or Halls were suffering from any unusual domestic problems which might start them down the roller coaster of anxiety. In his interview with the Roanoke Times, Officer Lemon expressed grave concern over the likelihood of the gas attacks turning fatal. Fortunately, though it was a conclusion built on sound reasoning, he was ultimately proved wrong. Other than disquieting memories, the only effect of the attacks approaching something permanent was that felt by Alice Huffman, and it is reasonable to assume in her case, as doctors did in 1933 and 34, that she was simply suffering from psychological stress, a totally understandable side effect of such a gross violation of her sense of personal safety. It may be argued that the reports of cars creeping along the road without headlights, people running into the woods, etc., were actually misinterpretations of unconnected or mundane events. However, even if one were to ascribe the cause of most of the events to be fantasies born of paranoia, one would be hard-pressed to hand-wave away all testimony. It is difficult to see how the sister and brother-in-law of Mrs. Hill would misinterpret someone prowling around the Hill's house, flashlight in hand, or how Chester Snyder would be so mistaken about someone skulking around the drainage ditch outside his home as to fire a shot from his gun. And in the Snyder case, the presence of someone was confirmed by both an agitated dog and a sheriff's deputy. No one during the initial weeks considered the events a hoax. In fact, as time went on, a significant amount of government resources were diverted into the matter, up to and including the barricading of county roads and the passage of laws. It was only when reports without substantiation became the norm that the idea of mass delusion or hysteria took center stage. It therefore seems plausible that one or more of the initial events were genuine. Perhaps the gas attacks were intended to frighten away occupants and allow for easy burglarizing. Perhaps they were an unsanctioned science experiment to test the efficacy of gas on unsuspecting subjects, or even to gauge psychological response. Or perhaps the gassings were performed by person or persons with motivations conceivable only to themselves. 
Something alerted the Huffman household and made Mrs. Huffman and her daughter ill. Something prompted them to open every window in their house in the dead of winter. What that something was, be it an ephemeral hysteria or wily criminal, we shall never know.